I was thinking it was something like roadkill flu because that's about how I felt, like roadkill. My mouth was, was dry and it had a certain roadkill quality to it too. And I laid there, wishing it would all just go away, pretty sure that I would be better off dead. No! Ever felt that way? There are other times I felt that way too. Lying in my bed, I could hear my parents screaming again. My dad was drunk. My mom was crying. They were arguing about the oil bill again. It was due, but the bar tab came first. And the money for Senex just wasn't there. The money was... The money was never there. It's one of the reasons they fought so much. That and the fact that my father, who used to be a weekend drunk, had become an everyday drunk. And as they went back and forth, I was pretty sure I would be better off dead. I felt that way a lot in junior and senior high school. If it wasn't problems at home, it was problems at school. Things hadn't exactly worked out the way I'd hoped in New Auburn. And I missed my old friends from Lake Holcomb. Especially my best friend, Gary. At least I had friends in Holcomb. In New Auburn, not so much. I never felt so alone, so scared. so weary and I would lay there wishing it would all just go wishing I could just go away and one thing was for certain I was pretty sure I would be better off dead as it turned out I was right I was right. I was better off dead. Provided, of course, I look at things from the perspective of Jesus Christ. And Paul, in writing the sixth chapter of Romans, helped me to see that. For he contends that we are all of us better off dead. Because if we die, then we will at last find life. Let's read Romans 6, 1-11 to to find out why. This is what Paul wrote in Romans 6, 1-11. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so too might we walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Paul 
Paul tells us in that passage that we are better off dead. Now, not physically dead, of course. We're not better off if we actually literally die. But we are better off, he says, if we die spiritually. If we are, in a sense, nailed to the cross spiritually. And that is true for three reasons. First of all, we are better off dead because it frees us to walk in newness of life. We are better off dead because it frees us to walk in newness of life. Now, most people, when they say to themselves, oh, I'd just be better off dead, they, they aren't really thinking they would be better off dead. They don't actually really want to die. Some people do sometimes. I understand that. But most of us, when we say that, we don't really want to die. What we want is we want transformation. We want things to change. We want things to be different. We don't want them to be the way they are now. We don't like what's happening now. We don't like it at all. We want something else. And when we say, oh, I wish I, I, would just, I, wish I were dead. I would be better off dead. What we're saying is, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I can't handle the situation. I want to move on from here. I don't want to be in this place. And Paul reminds us that we don't have to be in that place. We don't have to stay in that place. And we see the same thing in Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. Now, we won't read it. It's a long passage, but I'll give you the gist of what happens. As you remember, Abraham marries a woman named Sarah. Actually, Abram marries Sarah, but it's okay. They're now Abraham and Sarah. They're trying to have a baby. They're 100 years old. It's not working very well, right? So Sarah says to Hagar, you, go, go sleep with my husband. Don't ask. It's the Old Testament. So she goes and does that, has a baby, Ishmael, right? Ishmael starts to grow up. What happens to Sarah? She gets pregnant, has a baby, right? She no longer likes Ishmael at all. She wants Ishmael gone. So she goes to Abraham, her, hus her husband, and says, out, out with Ishmael. I don't want him here anymore. And Abraham is upset, doesn't know what to do. He says to God, what should I do? God says, go ahead, do this, it's okay. Send her away, I'll handle things. So Abraham goes to Sarah and says, you ha or goes to, goes to um, Hagar and says, you have to leave. You have to go, you can't stay here. He, he, he equips her well. He gives her a loaf of bread, a jug of water, and the clothes on her back. That's what he gives her, sends her out. So they go off into the desert, right? They're wandering around in the desert. They don't know where to go. They've got nowhere to, nowhere to be. And Hagar realizes they're out of water and her son's going to die. So she places them under a bush and she walks away because she does not want to see that happen. Hagar needed their lives to be changed, to be transformed. She needed out of that situation. She did not want her son to die. She had resigned herself to his death, but that is not what she wanted. And that is why she turned away. So she wouldn't have to witness what she didn't want. And in some respects, I suppose her son was better off dead. Ishmael and Hagar felt abandoned by Abraham, who, as I said, sent them away with nothing but some bread, a skin of water, and the clothes on their back. In their culture, that was the death sentence. Hagar couldn't support herself. There was nothing she could do for herself. And so, in many ways, compared to their alternatives, maybe they were, in some sense, better off dead. But God, but God had plans for them. That's what he told Hagar. I have plans for you to make Ishmael a mighty nation. Unaware of that plan, Hagar felt hopeless and helpless. She needed things to change. Hagar needed a new life. Now, let's be honest. That new life wouldn't be a trouble-free life. Hagar was still in, in a difficult situation. She was still on her own with nobody to support herself with a son to take care of. The problem didn't go away. Abraham didn't suddenly say, oh, I made a mistake. Come back to the house. We'll, we'll welcome you back in and we'll, we'll give you clothing and food and a place to live and it'll all be perfect again. It'll be a one big happy family and, and we'll be on TV as the man with many wives or something. That did not happen. That didn't happen. She would still have the troubles that she had. The difference would be she would no longer be alone. And she would have a promise to cling to that God had plans for her and her son, that they would be fine, that things would work out as God planned for them that no harm would come to them because God would be there with them. 
that they would make it through the difficulties they had to face. That is the new life that Christ promises us. Not a trouble-free life, but a life where he is present and with us and cares for us and loves us. But in order to find that new life, we have to die. That is what Hagar discovered. That is what Paul discovered. That is what I discovered. Nothing ever changes. Everything remains the same. You are what you are until the day you die. It was Hagar's death to self. Paul's death to self. My death to self that made the transformation we needed possible. We were, in Paul's words, better off dead. We were also better off dead, you and I, according to Romans chapter 6, because it frees us from sin. We are better off dead because it frees us from sin. Now, by the time I had gotten to junior high school, I was pretty good at sinning. It was really, really good. Chloe's like, yeah, really? Yeah, really, I was good, Chloe. <laughs> yeah, that was, I was good. So, you know, you're dancing, you get trophies and stuff. If there had been a trophy for sinning or a medal, I would have been gold, baby. So, <laughs> the things I struggled with were all the result of sin. Now, they weren't always the result of my sins. Some of my problems were rooted in the sins of my parents. But for the most part, I was responsible for the trouble I was in. It was my choices that led me to where I was, that led me to think that I would be better off dead. But God had plans for me to make me a man after God's own heart. Unaware of that plan, I felt hopeless and helpless. I needed my situation to change. I needed to be freed from my sin. Now let's be honest. The freedom from sin Paul talks about here is freedom from the death which results from our sin. It is the freedom to choose to not sin. It does not mean that you and I will never sin again once we become Christians. It does not mean that we will never make another mistake. It does mean that we are able to obey God and turn away from sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. We can choose not to sin. That's the new part of this. It also means that we will no longer pay the wages of sin, which is death. Jesus paid those wages for us on the cross. And as it turns out, that is all the freedom we really need. That is all the freedom Paul needed. That is all the freedom I needed. For when we are freed from sin in that way, we are freed to become like Christ. To share in the likeness of his resurrection, Paul says, we are in short given a second chance, a new life, in order that we might walk in obedience to God freed from the sin which formerly enslaved us. We are, you might say, better off dead. Finally, we are better off dead because it frees us to live for God. That's what we learned in verses 8 through 10 of Romans chapter 6. We are better off because it frees us to live for God. That's also something that Jesus communicated to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, 24 through 39. Let's actually turn to Matthew chapter 10, 24 through 39. Let's take a look at that passage. Matthew 10, 24 through 39. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become as his teacher and the slave as his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden 
that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Sorry, Paul. Therefore, do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be members of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his, he who has found his life shall lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus told us, there's a lot going on in that passage, we won't even scratch the surface, but Jesus told his disciples, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. When I moved to New Auburn, I tried to invent a new life for myself. I did that because I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to like me. That's a very natural human thing. We want people to like us. We don't want to be around people who don't like us, who, who give us a hard time. We want people to like us, to accept us, to love us. I wanted to be popular. I, I feared the rejection of my peers. I, I feared their judgment because, you know, the opinions of 15 and 16-year-olds in New Auburn, that's, that matters a lot. So... I was worried about it. I look back now and I think it seems silly, but back then it was a really huge concern for me. Now I look back and say, that's ridiculous. They're 15. Who cares what they think? I'll hit them with my car for heaven's sake. I don't, what, they don't matter. Actually, I probably would have back then. Good thing I didn't have a car. So, but, uh, can I get in trouble for that, Stacy? No, I'm okay. So, their opinions didn't really matter, but I thought they did. They were really important to me. And I ended up living and dying by those opinions. But God had plans for me to lead me to a place where I feared him, where I reverenced him more than anyone else. Unaware of that plan, I felt hopeless, helpless. I needed to learn to live for God, not the people around me. Now, let's be honest again. That doesn't mean that I am no longer influenced by what people think. I want you to like me, to pay my salary, I want you to vote for me in October. That's why the, September, the sermons are the only good sermons you get are in September because I'm thinking, October's coming. I've got to work on this a little bit. So, I mean, that's going on. That's, that's, I'm a human being. I still want you to approve of me and like me and, and pat me on the head and tell me I do a good job and that kind of stuff and, you know, slip 20s in my hand when I shake your hand and stuff. I want that to happen. Rats. So. But here's the thing. I wanted those around me to like me for who I was. But they would not or could not do that. So I ended up feeling rejected and lonely. The truth was that I valued their opinion a little too much. And God's opinion, far too little. I loved them more than God and was therefore not worthy of God. But it was God who held my life in the palm of his hand. Not a gaggle of teenagers in northern Wisconsin. It was God who loved me as I was. It was God who loved me as I was, but also loved me enough to help me become something more. And what I needed, I found, was to lose my life 
in order to find it. I needed to confess Jesus before those I feared so much so that he would confess me before the Father. And when I did that, I was free to live for God, free to live for the one who loved me more, who loves me more than anyone else. This morning, God is inviting you and I, or you and me, this word tells me you and me, to die. Not physically, but spiritually. We are being invited to allow our old selves to be buried with Jesus through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so too might we walk in newness of life. We are being invited to put to death our old body of sin that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We are being invited to consider ourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know exactly where you are. Perhaps at some point this year or this month or this week, the thought occurred to you that you would be better off dead. Maybe you are sick of your situation. Maybe you are sick of your own sin. Maybe you are sick of being mistreated by those around you who are supposed to love you. And the answer is not found in seeking to run away from your problems, from your sin or your shame or your loneliness. It is found in running into the arms of God who invites you to let go of your life as it is now, to be transformed by his power in order that you might live. I know what it is like to feel hopeless and helpless. That is where I was as a teenager in New Auburn. That is where I find myself from time to time, even now. What I need when I find myself in that place, what you need when you find yourself in that place, is to be freed to walk in newness of life, to be freed from your sin, to be freed to live for God. What you and I need is to experience the transformation Jesus freely offers us. That offer was made possible for the, through the sacrifice of Jesus who died for us on the cross. Through his death, you and I are able to walk in the newness of life, to no longer be slaves to sin, to be found alive to God in Jesus Christ. And so I am thankful that you are all of us better off dead. Amen.